scribble notes, uh, scribble notes when I wrote these quotes. If I offend, pardon me, there's more of me to grow. Creative in my process, enjoy the show. The will is different when you recognize the different strokes. Different folks, same goals, we all want the most. So when we reach the top, we can enjoy the toast. The type of bread we get is fresh about the bakery. Told them don't play with me. With or without a degree, don't question my intensity. Bravery, similar to agencies that want to see you fall. So just pray for me and pray for me. Yeah, pray for me. Einstein with my energy. Welcome to the Scribble Notes podcast. What is your day like today? Are you having a great day? It's been awesome, actually. <laughs> it's been a really good day. <laughs> we love that. We love a good day out here. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself for the listeners and um, tell them a little bit about who you are. Right. My name is Astrid. I grew up in South Africa. And I currently live in Sweden with my husband and our two children. I have a bit of a mixed background. Mm. I studied social anthropology, English literature, and psychology, and have been muddling my way through ever since. Because I just <laughs> I needed the English literature because I've been writing since I was 12, and I didn't want to let go of that childhood dream of actually becoming a published writer. But at the same time, I was stuck in a very negative mental state of believing that writing was not going to be a good career move. And I thought psychology was the way forward. But to take two majors in my undergraduate studies, I had to have several electives and anthropology kind of stuck. <laughs> That's the one that uh, the one that really stuck out to you. Yeah, it was the one that became my passion. I mean, my grades were just way, way better in social anthropology than in any of my other subjects. And it just was clear to me that this is something that's important to me and I just need to just keep going with it to the point where I actually have done a master's in social anthropology. Mm. Mm. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so you're also... A USA best-selling author, which is really awesome too. I think you didn't mention an award-winning that, that, author. Yes, that that's an, a very recent and very incredible tick in the box, mm. making making those childhood dreams come true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just casually. Yeah, I had the good fortune of participating in a group endeavor, which was a boxed set of fairy tale retellings. Hmm. where I contributed one novel, which is one retelling, to a set of 20 books. And we were raising money towards a autism charity. Hmm. And that one, that one hit the list, which was just, it was an amazing experience. Oh, that's amazing. Um, can you talk a little bit about your journey into, into writing and what made you decide to, to become a published author? Because it's like, it's not always that everyone's like, oh, let me become a published author. Let me write all these interesting genres also. Um, what made you what made you want to be published? I think I'm going to start with what made me want to write, because I think that's really the important one in this case. I've been writing for a very long time. I actually found out more recently that I've been writing for longer than I knew because I keep telling people I started when I was 12 and my aunt pulled out some proof of my writings from earlier than that, all the way to when I was five. So I have been writing on and off my whole life. The big spark for me came when I was 12. I loved fantasy. My mom had read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings to me by that time along with some other books. I think by then I'd, I'd started with Philip Pullman's series of the Northern Lights, but it was before I actually got into Harry Potter. As so I was at this cusp, I love fantasy, but I'd read so many stories with boys as the main characters, and I didn't like that. And then I also had this little multicultural South African experience of well why are the elves and the dwarves and the humans and everyone in this multicultural fantasy society always western <laughs> 
And I wanted to break away from that. So my very, very first project was an urban fantasy set in Uganda with African magic. And the social anthropology has actually helped to really solidify the the basis and, and do the research for that book, which is not published yet. It's not ready yet, but we're getting there and it's definitely on its way. And so that kind of, even as I was working on this project, I had other ideas. So when I was 15, I read Ella Enchanted, which is a Cinderella retelling. And that one kind of hit me as I loved it and hated it at the same time because I loved the idea of how it was told, how, how it was presented, and particularly the whole idea that Cinderella and the prince meet before the ball. But then it was yet another Cinderella retelling. And since there are, it, there's at least one movie a year that comes oh, out yeah. <laughs> with Cinderella. <laughs> and if you look at the books, the, the quantity of Cinderella retellings is mind-blowing. And I felt like there are so many beautiful fairy tales out there. And particularly my dad is German. So I actually have both the Grimm brothers in German and English collections. Mm. And they are different. There are different fairy tales in, in their sort of, generally known collections in the two different languages and I really liked a fairy tale called brother and sister which is about a a girl and a boy who run away from home uh, and their witch of a stepmother transforms the brother into a, a deer and so now the girl is stuck in the forest taking care of her brother trying to keep him away from the wolves kind of scenario <laughs> <laughs> And then one day the king's hunting party rides by. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and it actually turns out that her brother leads the king to her so that they can have a happily ever after. But what I particularly liked about this, this story is that it doesn't end with the marriage. They, they actually get married and have children and the plot continues after the marriage. And she actually has her whole face off with the stepmother well into her marriage mm. and that that really worked for me because there are a lot of fairy tales that kind of give you this subconscious message that well the whole adventure ends when you tie the knot <laughs> yes yeah. when love is found sit well with me even <laughs> as a youngster so I I really wanted to do a retelling of that story and I took a gap year when I was 19 and mm. that summer I had an opportunity so I just sat down and I wrote that retelling and it kind of had that Ella Enchanted feel to it, but is then a retelling of Brother and Sister. And so when I then decided almost three years ago that I wanted to publish my books, that it was time and that if I didn't do it, it would be something I would regret not having done. Mm. It kind of made sense to take the book that was finished and publish that. Yeah. Yeah. And that is Aspiring and Becoming, a two-part uh, fairy tale retelling. Uh, here we go. Here's Aspiring. Hey. It's part one of the sibling's tale. And then Becoming is part two of the sibling's tale. Mm. Wow. That is like so awesome. I, I just love the inspiration. I love the I love the full story. Like the you could just really see um from the very beginning to becoming an author and actually writing and finding a story that resonates and why you did the retelling it's like it's really powerful so what's your um just to shift gears a little bit what's your process what's your process like um how do you decide on how you're going to tell a story how do you how do you write how do you do your prose like tell me about tell me about you as an author that depends on every story. <laughs> <laughs> but let's go for another one that I have here, which is um, also my most popular book at the moment is The Apprentice Storyteller. Mm. And so this one came about, I had some ideas for some shorter works, some sh shorter fiction. They were all standalone stories, but I didn't like the idea of having a... a 
an anthology, a short story collection with just the short stories just thrown in there with no, no connection. Hmm. And then I came up with a frame story, which is sort of in the style of A Thousand and One Nights, where you have a person telling the story and then the shorter stories are sort of embedded into it. And so this is the, the tale of a young boy who wants to become a storyteller, who meets the most famous storyteller in the land and convinces her, despite her adamant rejection of his <laughs> idea, yeah, he finally convinces her to take him on as her apprentice. And that's their, the frame, essentially. But I kept getting stuck on it. And I didn't know where it was going. And it just it just didn't work. And it turned out that that particular block was because I wasn't ready to write the story yet because mm. I hadn't done the work that I needed to do to learn the information that was needed for the book. So a few years ago, I realized what I'd hated about psychology so much, which was my least favorite <laughs> university subject, was the fact that the psychologist is the one who tells you what's wrong with you. And mm. that just never sat right with me. But then I came across life coaching, which is the general idea that the person, the client you are coaching knows how to overcome their personal obstacles. And as a life coach, you are there to guide them to their own solution. And that was that missing link for me. And so it turns out that it's not just about a boy learning about stories from a master storyteller. It's about a woman who has struggled in life and has had difficulties and has very firm beliefs on how the world works, learning that maybe she doesn't have all the answers and that perhaps a 13-year-old boy knows more <laughs> about life than she does. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love a story that shows so many that shows so many more angles to a uh, narrative. And from there, I was able to outline a plot with a basic idea of where each of the embedded stories need to go and how they were woven in to show more about the history of the play of, of the peoples, because both Viola, the storyteller and Joe, her apprentice, come from different cultures. So I use the stories to kind of give a little bit of depth to their histories. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was simply a matter of doing NaNoWriMo in 2019 and writing the book <laughs> in 20 days. It took me 20 days. To wow. Write. That's awesome. Yeah. It was, it was incredible. It was a very, very amazing experience to finally have something that I've been thinking about for over 10 years just come together in 20 days. It was quite incredible. Mm. And then COVID hit. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly realized that there was this confluence of energy that I'd written a book that shows a new way of thinking about life, the universe and everything. And then, you know, shit just hit the fan and everything was going absolutely insane. I mean, people were in lockdown all over the place. There was travel bans. It was, it was just insane. The world was just changing before our eyes. And so many, many people didn't know how to deal with it or how to face it. And we were hearing awful accounts of in, in Sweden, the, the, the rate of child abuse doubled, I think. It was, it was pretty terrible. And, and I do know that violence in the home in other countries also increased quite tremendously. And it made me think, of well, it's a sign that people aren't coping. So mm. I felt I really needed to publish the book as soon as possible. And thankfully managed to get it out in December of 2020. And it's mm. been out for a year now. Mm. I know that's a that's a proud moment when you finally get it done, when you finally like pressed, when it's out there into the world and you see it available for sale and you see people uh, and you hear yeah. reactions. How was that feeling for you? It's been amazing. I think I got my first two star re review 
no, it wasn't even a review. It was just a rating, a two star <laughs> rating one month ago. So the book had been out for 11 months, mm. has over 70 ratings on Amazon. And one, only one of those is two. <laughs> the rest are all three, four and five. Oh, so awesome. been, it's been really amazing to read ha- the responses of people. And even the people who disliked the book had a lot of nice things to say about it. So that kind of felt like, oh, that's so nice. Yeah. <laughs> like anything nice is so amazing. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that process leading up to releasing the book, marketing and all the other things you had to do to, to prepare for your release? Um, what was that like? That one was tough. The Apprentice Storyteller was really tough because the finances weren't there. So what I ended up doing was a crowdfund mm. in when, what was, uh, April, April and May of 2020. And I mean, I am so, so grateful to especially my family, my extended family and close friends who contributed. And then there were several author friends who chipped in. So that was that was really amazing because that made it possible for me to get the cover done professionally by a designer I admire. Uh, she's absolutely amazing. I mean, just look at it. It's beautiful. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> It's she's the real wizard phenomenal. and and then also um have my my editor go three full rounds on the book and she I mean I it was good it was solid before she started but she just managed to tweak those small things and it just flows so beautifully now I'm, I'm just I'm so proud of all the work that went into making it what it what it has become and then, yeah, so I had originally planned to publish it in August of 2020, but I ran into a bit of trouble because I had another um, cover designer who took a stab at doing a cover for it and it just didn't work. You know, our communication just wasn't there. And that's that's one thing that I found so, so important. In the, There was the biggest lesson of publishing this book is that a designer can be really, really good at what they do. But if you can't communicate your vision and they can't then produce something with the designer mindset that enhances what your original vision is, then it's, it's not going to work. And it doesn't matter how good they are. If the communication isn't there, it's not going to work. <laughs> so... I ditched that one completely. You know, it did hurt that, you know, that was another hundred (laughs) dollars towards that. But, you know, in the end, it was worth it because I'm pushed out the release date, which meant I had more time to do marketing for the book. And especially after it was um, fully edited, I could then put up teasers and make uh, book, book trailers and stuff. Mm. that made it a lot more powerful in terms of marketing and, and just reaching people. I was, I had that time to do that. And then I was lucky enough that I managed to land a book bub featured deal, a featured new release, mm. which, which was sent out two days after I published the novel. Wow. And it was amazing. I got my banner and everything. It was oh, wow. so amazing to be a new release, number one new release on Amazon for about five days over Christmas period. Mm. It was crazy. Wow. That is amazing. So so what has marketing been like after the book was released? So every day following, because I know it never ends. At like, it never ends. It's, it's, a, and- it's a process <laughs> that continues to go on every single day. Well, I think the biggest thing that I did right with this one was that I chose to pull the longer stories out and turn them into a series of novellas that as an accompanying series. And that has really helped because it means I have regular releases that are connected to the book. Mm. And so then I... I have The Apprentice Storyteller in Kindle Unlimited, 
And so with the Amazon exclusive deal, that means that I can then do regular sales. And that I coincide those with the releases of the, the shorter novellas. And then also each novella has a prologue and an epilogue that tie back into where it is in this apprentice storyteller that this particular story has been told mm. and try. So I've, I've really managed to get that integrated system and it, it's definitely working. So every time I release one of the tales, then I get by through and, and others, other books bought from, from this series. So that, mm. that works really well. I also have just started the cover reveal for the next book in this in the series which is a continuation of the storytellers um, part of the this sequence it's called finding the way and um i'm really excited the cover is fantastic so <laughs> i'm doing the cover reveal slide by slide on instagram so mm. it's going to be a couple more days before the full the full picture reveals itself but it's it's fun and and i've actually decided to do it a year in advance so i'll be publishing in december mm -hmm. of 2022 giving myself again time to do the marketing get that pre-order yep. <laughs> rolling nicely and in the meantime i have some more releases of the shorter some more shorter stories coming this year so next month i'll be publishing warring lions which is a short story set in this universe of the apprentice storyteller but it's got some some new things like lion shifters <laughs> which right. is a lot of fun it's been All fun right. to write <laughs> no that's so cool i i love that like idea of continuing to have content as you're releasing the big project you're like still coming up with novellas and short stories and things that kind of feed and loop back into the the book that you're releasing and the book that you have out like that's such a good idea and I think that's really underrated because as authors there's always stories in your head there's always things that you that you want to explore and you're giving yourself the space to do that which is really cool definitely and I think it's also it's also helpful for the readers to have something that comes out more regularly because when you're and, and also that there's a cap on how big the series is going to be. So all of the shorter novellas are standalones. So you don't have to have read one, two, and three now that book four is coming out. So it, it, it makes that helpful in, in a way. But it also means that it's got this, this constant content that leads into the main novel although it allows me time to write in between. So it's okay if I take a year or two between novels in the same series, because I find it's, it's really hard to, to do a whole series, especially if you're thinking five and up mm. books in a series and then do a rapid release of all of them because there's a lot of costs involved and you see no return at all in that time that you're writing and editing and getting everything ready yeah. and then you release it, which is nice for the readers because then it goes quickly and they don't have to wait for the next book. But it's, it's, it's a struggle for a lot of us to be able to manage that, especially if we're unknown authors. So being able to constantly have new content coming out that allows new people to discover you every time and then you have, you know, your back catalog of books that are related in some way that people can read while they wait for the next novel to come out. It, it, is, it is a helpful strategy that seems to be working for me. We interrupt this episode to talk a little bit about Sun Scholars. Sun Scholars is a nonprofit committed to improving educational equity and college graduation rates for those students who have experienced foster care or adoption. Sun Scholars Inc. is dedicated to serving Connecticut's former foster youth with a student-first mentality. Their goal is to support individuals and help them reach their best outcomes. If you'd like to learn more about Sun Scholars or how to donate, check out their website, sunscholarsinc.org. That's sunscholarsinc.org. Now, back to the show. Right. Mm. 
No, that is a, that's such an awesome, an awesome idea, awesome strategy. And I think people listening can definitely consider uh, taking that and seeing if it works for themselves as well, because it's something that I haven't really heard many people talk about as a consistent strategy, which I think is really important. Um, it's probably sharing knowledge because going through this process as an author and writing and publishing and then doing it, uh, doing a lot of it by yourself is such a daunting it's task. Tough. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's very tough. And especially if you're then working on the side to mm -hmm. pay the bills and uh, as my husband puts it, fund your habit <laughs> <laughs> of editing and, and designing books. <laughs> oh yeah yeah it's the ha it's a habit it's, it is a habit. you know it i think it's a better habit to have than anything else that's out there yeah, <laughs> so, uh, yeah not doing too much not doing too much damage <laughs> yeah. um so for for people who are looking to become authors um what's some advice that you can give them as they're like going through this decision um i know for myself when i first started writing like I made the decision to become a published author um, really quickly. What advice do you have for people who want to become a published authors and want to have their writing published? Well, two things. The first is write from the heart. Write what you want to say. The, the words that spill out of you are the right ones. When you're trying to force something, reset ask the right question and find the way that is the correct path for you and your story. Because I've often seen books where they, maybe they're writing to a specific market or a specific trend and it feels fake even as you read it. You can tell that the author's heart isn't in the story. There's no deeper meaning to it. It's very superficial. And it's one of those ones, well, okay, it might be well-written. It could be fun. It could be a good plot. But it's not something that's going to sit in your heart and stay with you for the rest of your life. And honestly, as, as a writer and a reader, you want to create those kind of books that are going to stay with people, that are going to touch people. And for that to happen, you have to write what's meaningful to you. And then the second part is get it edited properly. Because even I, who have a degree in English, <laughs> even Margaret Atwood, who's been writing for God knows how long, all of us need an editor because we make mistakes. There are things that slip through. There are things we don't see because that's how we talk. That's how we write. But a third party can see it. And the thing is, your friend who has two years of English in the bank can help. But a, an editor who knows what they're doing, who has the experience and who, who's worked with stories offers invaluable extras for your books. And it, I cannot stress this enough. It's hugely important. It makes the difference between your book looking amateurish and your book being amazing. <laughs> and it's, it's something I, as a reader, I mean, I've been supporting fellow indie writers over the past two and a half years. And I find it time and time again, I come across books I would have loved. The plot is fantastic. The idea is good. It's unique. It's thrilling. There's, they've got everything, but the writing is bad and it ruins the experience. It totally, it makes it a slog to read. And there are some that I have stopped reading. I have not finished reading because I can tell from chapter two, I'm not going to like this book and I'm going to be forced to give the author a two or three star rating at the highest. And I don't want to do that. And so then I reach out and I say, hey, like, look, I can tell. You know, your book is fantastic. It has a great idea, but it's not edited properly and I'm going to struggle to read it and it's going to be a slog for me and I'm not going to enjoy it. And that means I cannot honestly give you higher than a three-star rating. Mm. What do you want me to do? And most of them get prissy with me 
and tell me to stop then, you know, if I'm going to be that way. <laughs> yeah, it's your fault. My point is most readers aren't going to read past page three mm-hmm. if they see mistakes. Because if a reader who doesn't have a background in English can tell that you're making mistakes or that it's not well polished, then the slightly higher educated readers aren't even going to bother with your book. And then what's the point? If you're putting readers off from early on, then what's the point? And that's why polish, 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 polish. It's really important. Three stages of of editing is hugely important because you need the developmental editing to really get the plot tight so that you don't have any scenes that, that don't have any meaning to the book. You need to have everything flowing through so that it pulls the reader from start to finish and they don't lose interest. And then you need the line edit, which is the language, making sure that every sentence is structurally correct, that it flows properly, because that, again, drives you through from start to finish. Because if it flows, you just don't stop. You just keep going Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you're just in the flow. You're in the current and it just takes you with it. And then the last one is the proofreading to catch those pesky little errors that slip through because there's always something that slips through. Yes, literally. <laughs> there's always. A, there, there will always be a word. Because, I mean, even after my fantastic editor who has tons of experience has done all three rounds, I will get my proof copy and I'll still find errors in the book. <laughs> mm. Yeah, unavoidable, unavoidable. I was going to ask, um, because editing is so important, how does one decide or find which editor is best for them? That's always a toughie. It's, there's, there are so many people out there who market themselves as editors who have no clue. I've had people reach out to me who have who then allowed to take a look at one of my sh- or a short story here and there to test them. And I can tell that my level of English is higher than theirs. And so they mess up stuff that I know is right. Oh, no. (laughs) So it's hard. It's really hard to find a decent editor. One thing that I know that I've used myself is is either shorter works or a piece. So you do a first chapter, for example, and you test them through all three stages. What would working with this editor be like for the entire process of editing the book and a chapter is a couple of thousand words that's not going to break the bank if it goes south because your gut will tell you if it's working or not of course the higher your level of english the easier it is to double check on what the editor is doing and saying and be able to verify that it's right you know because we most of us go like oh yeah of course uh, duh. that's that's what it's supposed to be yes absolutely but there are some nuances where you deliberately do something for stylistic effect and the editor doesn't get it <laughs> or <laughs> you're using specific words very clearly because that's part of your artistic style and these are words they don't know and there you can then quite easily find out who's right and who's wrong for you definitely gut feel is helpful and then also recommendations like ask people in your genre whose books you've read well who do they use who do they edit you can even check in the in the the front of books all books will state who the editor is in the copyright page and then obviously with indie writers you can then find the editors who will be more affordable than the (laughs) ones who work for traditional publishing houses yeah yeah that's uh (laughs) very 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 different price ranges yes absolutely so we talked a little bit about writing a little about your process and marketing um how have you made your presence known on online? How have you gotten um, fans and readers? Uh, what have been the things that really work for you? 
It's a bit all over the place, but the one strategy that's been working really well for me is that I put the first book in that spin-off series called The Word Mages Tales um, is free. And so I have a perma-free novella that is connected to both the, the series of shorter stories and then the, the apprentice storyteller. And I message all my new Instagram followers that this book is available. And then periodically I do blasts on Facebook and other pages that, hey, this book is free. Take a look at it. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a constant stream of people who pick up that particular book. I published it, I think, six months ago now. And I've had a, or oh, I've seen a, a rise in the number of sales. It's not much yet. It's not going to be funding <laughs> anything yet and certainly not making me a full-time author anytime soon. But there is definitely a, a ball that's rolling mm. and it's, it's growing. And then the fans, that's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I release a new book, I put out a, an offer for advanced review copies and I've been building a street team. And then through fellow authors letting their fans know that I'm publishing a book, I've gathered about a core group of about five or six that are absolutely amazing. They're simply amazing readers. They re they've read everything I've written reviewed all of it every time I have something new going if it's an, a cover reveal or a pre-order announcement or the actual release they'll be there cheering from the sidelines they often tag me when they tell their friends on Facebook all about my books <laughs> <laughs> they're really they're fantastic and so yes it's taken me I'd say a year and a half since I started working on with the street team to get this core group of, of five super fans. And then the, the larger team, which is probably at around 50 or 60 strong. Mm. And it works. It needs to be bigger, but it's a starting point. And I'm, I'm in a much better position than I was when I published my first book where I had nothing. And so it's, it's happening <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's awesome to hear I think uh coming up with strategies and seeing the long term is something that um especially people who are self-published really have to under like understand is that like you can't look at this as a short-term results driven um kind of thing it's going to take a while to build and then grow and organically do it and not have to Absolutely. spend hundreds of dollars every time you need people to read the book. And, and also to be prepared to give away free copies. Mm. Like I've, I've been sort of of two minds about Amazon's option to, if, you, if you're exclusive on Amazon, you can either do five days where the book is free, the ebook is free, or a week long what they call a Kindle countdown deal where you can change the price in increments. And so you can have two days, for example, at, where the ebook is at 99 cents and then it goes up to 199 for a day or two. And then it goes up to 299 until you end it. And then it goes back to full price. And both are useful. But in the, in the early days, I kind of did a lot more freebies because that was just getting the word out there with my, my first couple of books. But I was hesitant to do it with The Apprentice Storyteller because it was so, so successful in the first week. So I've been doing Kindle countdown deals with it, actually. And those have, those have worked. But then I thought, okay, well, you know, it's, it's a year. The book um, made it to the top 10 finalists of the Author Elite Awards. So, you know, it's been, it's been a very successful year. Let's celebrate that. And so I put it up for free and I had, I think, 1,300 downloads oh my of gosh. my book over the five days, <laughs> which is huge. So I thought, you know what, it's, 
sometimes sometimes it's worth it to give away the book for free because you get people who then read your book and there will be those few out there who will love it mm. and who will tell their friends about that and there will be some more who love it and read all your other books <laughs> and love those <laughs> so, so it does it does serve a purpose and i I'm looking forward to see the results of that. I have had a few more reviews trickle in over the last few weeks mm. since doing the freebie. So I can definitely say that it does make a difference. And I'm going to get my first book with 100 reviews this year. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to do this. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I've run a few um, free campaigns for my books and I will run some ads also to my free stuff so I can get even more push. And I remember the first one I got, I think, 350 downloads. And I was mm. like, this is incredible because yeah. I just never thought I could reach that many people. And I think it's it is really cool because you do give people a chance to to kind of read the book, get your style, yeah. you get some exposure and potentially more more new fans, which is something that us as authors, is, it's like the best feeling is when people read the book and yeah. the better feeling is when people review the book for anyone listening, make sure you review the yes. books that you read. <laughs> and honestly, I really enjoy getting negative reviews. They mm. really help me improve as a writer. I, um, I received a, a rather negative review on, on one of my, my earlier retellings because I have written several other fairy tale retellings other than brother and sister and it was it was kind of the, the, the reader was so apologetic about not liking my book and I'm like that's totally okay I understand you don't have to like my book thank you for writing a review <laughs> yeah just thank you for the review <laughs> that goes so much further absolutely and I I understand that readers are hesitant because they know that they might hurt your feelings. Mm -hmm. But honestly, the review, the review is important because there are other readers like you out there who are not going to like the book. And we don't want those readers to buy the book because then they're going to be unhappy. And we don't want that. And conversely, I, I myself have done this. There are lots of people out there who read the negative reviews and they go, all the things this person hates, tick all the boxes for stuff I love. Mm -hmm. And so they buy the book because they want to give the author a boost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, take the book. It, it, it goes such a long way. And it does. Even my first reviews and like, I still, I remember I reached out to some people on YouTube when they said some reviews. And it was like awesome to even hear their feedback on the book because it's something that sat with me for so long that I just wanted yeah. to know what everyone else thought. Um, yeah. And they had some they had some feedback. They had some good, some, some things they loved, some things they didn't like. And it was really cool because even if they're even while they were telling me criticism or critiques, I was just like, wow, they read the book. Like you could tell because they read this chapter and they read this and they like exactly. you, I could see that they read it. And it just made me feel so good because uh you you're you're creating and you're creating for for an audience and you're hoping that the words that you say will resonate and stick with you and stick with others and seeing someone who can give you criticism but also be like but this story and the meaning behind this uh, for me it was everyone who said the ending like really stuck with them and I was like yes that's what I wanted at the end I really just wanted that ending to really land it's it just an awesome feeling and I think um as, as aspiring authors that might be listening to the podcast and people who are current writers, uh, that's what it's all about. Like it's the connection that you make with, with others that really makes this work totally way more worth it, especially yeah. when you're not making a living off of it. Absolutely. And I think there's also something that's really powerful about indie writing because before publishing my books myself, I rarely read anything indie. But now that's 80 percent, 80 to 90 percent of what I read. And indies do things that traditional publishing, published books don't do. And it's awesome. <laughs> it's so <laughs> fresh and new. It's, you know, we're moving away from the whole paint by numbers. You have mm -hmm. complete mashups of different ideas. You know, it's like people who love this book and that book and then create something that's sort of a mashup of both or uh, 
one one author I absolutely loved her books. She she did a vampire romance very much like Twilight, but she was actually as you read it, you can see she's criticizing certain aspects of Twilight <laughs> that were just totally unfathomably stupid. <laughs> so this awesome i love it <laughs> yeah like that, that's what it's about and that's why yeah. I, I love indie i love indie indie books uh that's the most of my shelf and most of the people i end up speaking to because it's just so you get you get this freedom to be yourself yeah. um even more so than if you had to go another route and create something that's more commercially appealing or whatever that might be I mean the commercially appealing is useful absolutely I don't deny that and for those authors who actually manage to get decent traditional contracts go for it I mean amazing good for you but you know people like me who write very much niche things like I mean my fairy tale retellings with characters of color uh, drawing on cultures from very obscure parts of the world to create my fantastical cultures uh, looking at our human potential for transformation it's a mashup yes it's fantasy it's definitely fantasy it's also very definitely fairy tale retellings the ones that are but it's niche it's niche in the traditional concept because I don't have you know massive epic fantasy battles with dragons and those ideas i don't have a wheel of time i have something a lot more low fantasy than that <laughs> so and this is the thing the people who read my books love my books and so sure i don't have millions of people reading my books i have a couple of hundred people reading my books but that's great it's mm -hmm. awesome it's and amazing at least at least my books are out there and considering that i spent most of my teens and all of my 20s telling myself that it wasn't worth it and I should just write for myself because publishing was not going to get me anywhere. This is great. I really think I've made major progress in three years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's awesome to see like what a, what a small shift and what one decision can really do saying I'm going to publish this yeah. book and I'm going to put this out into the world and seeing how you can impact other people just through your writing um something that almost seems impossible i remember being a kid in in high school and we used to have the summer reading stuff that we had to do and oh, just gosh, thinking yeah. about all the summer reading books and it was always the same authors and stuff and thinking like i could never be a book like that like how could you write a story like a real story that resonates and that stretches chapter after chapter that people are interested in and now I'm doing that and like now I see it and I talk to people and they actually are like wow I just I just finished this chapter I just finished this whatever it's it is an incredible feeling and it's an incredible shift uh that goes on so we're coming up on the end of our yeah, time I, though so I did want to give you I'm sorry but I just really have to add that the yeah, second add, add. school was my personal <laughs> horror because <laughs> I'm South African going to a South African German foreign school in South Africa. And so I had German literature, English literature, and Afrikaans literature as my set works at school. And I can tell you, oh, they were horrible. They were so horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I loved reading the books that I got to read in my spare time and I was an avid mm -hmm. reader, but I really dragged my feet on the set works that I had to read for school. <laughs> I think there was one book in the entirety of my high school career that I enjoyed reading in school. <laughs> there was, uh, I'll, I'll say there was one time when I had to read, I think we read The Scarlet Letter. Um, and okay. my first time reading The Scarlet Letter, I read the pop-up book version because I just couldn't get through the original mm -hmm. translation for it because it was so difficult. Um, and it makes me laugh Much, now because... Yeah. Now I'm like, oh, why did I not read that piece of art <laughs> like the way the author wanted it? Yeah, but I mean, like teenage brains are very different from adult brains. <laughs> we just can't. You just can't read it. It's too much. <laughs> yeah, way, way too much on the mind. Um, so I did want to give you a chance to plug where people can find you, where they can buy your books um, and anything else that you have coming up next. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So. Yeah, on social media, I'm most active on Facebook and Instagram. 
My Instagram handle is astra.v.j underscore author underscore official. And that's the place where I do all the talking about my books, the themes of my books, the cover reveals. That's my main platform. And then I also have the Astrid VJ USA Today bestselling author page on Facebook, where I inform about upcoming releases and specials and giveaways and such things. And then all my books are available on Amazon. Some of them are available on Kindle Unlimited. And then I also have a few books that are available on other sites like Barnes and Noble's Nook and iBooks, etc. So you, you can find me. Some of my books are even on Scribd. So if you have a Scribd subscription, you can get them there. And I do actually also have a Wattpad page. So my free books are available there too. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for making time in and giving us so much information. I feel like I've learned a ton, so many things to think about as I'm preparing for my third book. Um, I think anyone that's listening is going to take away a lot from, from what you talked about and what you, what you said. Um, any, any last pieces of advice, any last thoughts that you want to leave us with? Go for it. Just do it. Don't hold yourself back with all these thoughts of what if, or it's not worth it. It's always worth it. If your heart wants to do it, it's worth it. So just do it. And the sooner, the better. <laughs> Even though, yes, some people like me need to go through a 20 year period of finding ourselves and finding the truth in our writing to then be able to really blossom. I learned a lot in the time that I was not writing. <laughs> and doing other things but honestly if you feel you need to write just write if you want to then publish that do the steps do the work polish it get it ready and then go for it because each process is a whole new learning curve everything is new and so yes you have loads to learn but the sooner you start learning the better right mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was awesome. Um, I really do appreciate you making time and coming on the podcast. And for the listeners, this is the end. So Thanks you so, know so very is. much for having me. Yeah, yes. it's been awesome. Thank you. Peace out. Thank you. Bye. Scribble notes, uh, scribble notes when I wrote these quotes. If I offend, pardon me, there's more me to grow. Me to grow. Creative in my process, enjoy the show. The will is different when you recognize the different strokes. Different folks, same goals, we all want the most. So when we reach the top, we can enjoy the toast. The type of bread we get is fresh about the bakery. Told them don't play with me. With or without a degree, don't question my intensity. Bravery, similar to agencies that want to see you fold. So just pray for me and pray for me. Yeah, pray for me. Einstein with my energy.